Hi, I'm Joan Bolton. I'm a local garden designer. I specialize in designing colorful water conserving gardens. I've been in business for just over 20 years and I'd like to show you a garden that I recently did that exemplifies a lot of the different concepts I like to incorporate in people's gardens. So when I first met with my clients, this was entirely kikuyu grass, just a straight, flat lawn. There were a little bit of shrubs on the far side and they had a few shrubs against the house, but basically it was just flat. What they wanted to do was create some topography, create some interest. They love hummingbirds, and so we definitely wanted to include habitat for birds as well as beneficial insects and butterflies. And also they wanted to emphasize water conservation. They were tired. They've been in the house for more than 40 years, and they were tired of pouring all their water into their lawn and just having this flat appearance. So when I first meet with my clients, one of the first things I do is talk to them about how they'd like to use the space. And then I always try to figure out how they're gonna get to those spaces. In this garden, their only entrance to the front door was across their driveway, scooching around the cars, cutting around a sharp corner, and heading down a narrow pathway to the front. So one of the first things I did was say, okay, we need a new entrance. And over here, what we've done is we've done these landing pads, small one for the mailbox, much larger one for the spot where we identified, we actually parked a car out here to make sure that we knew where people were gonna park, did this eight foot wide landing strip. And then over here, we created this entirely new beautiful entrance, wandering its way, we created topography. We did mounds and contoured the soil so that instead of a flat space, there's a lot of interest. We did the bridge over the dry creek bed that I'll talk about in just a minute. And then we curved back over to that entrance to the front door. But what we also did is we widened the pathway. We took the same flagstone that we have in these new paths and did an edging along the pathway to the front door so that they had a wider space to walk on. If you come this way, what we've done is you can see that the bridge is actually over a dry stream bed. What we've done is with the main downspouts for the house, we put in new gutters on the house and the one on the front right, as well as the one on the garage, those gutters feed into this dry stream bed and it's contoured so that what happens is the, it keeps the water on site. Will this ever flow in a heavy rainstorm? We don't know because we haven't had that weather yet. But the idea is that the water is collected off the roof, it comes into the dry stream bed and it slows it down. Then it spreads it out into the adjoining soil where it provides extra deep moisture for the plants in the garden, so sort of a long-lasting reservoir. Eventually it should percolate, if there's anything left, down into the groundwater basin and it doesn't go out to the street out to the ocean. One of my main underlying philosophies about being a designer is providing a diversity of plants. I'm a real plant nut, but the thing about it in the garden is that by providing a diversity of plants, you're providing seasonal interest year round for not only the client, the neighbors, everyone who comes by, but also for the wildlife that inhabits the space. In this garden, what I'm doing is a combination of Mediterranean plants, native plants and succulents, all of which provide that year-round buffet to everyone. This plant over here on my right is uh, one of the many beautiful sages that we can grow here. This is one called Amistad. It is a huge hummingbird magnet and bee magnet and tiny little, if you get up close with a microscope, tiny little insects are working their way through too. Not pests, but the good guys. Some of the native plants that I selected for this landscape include Centennial Ceanothus. It's this extremely low-growing, all-green, evergreen ground cover. Gets real cute little blue flowers in the spring. And after the second year, you take off the irrigation. It just survives on this, the natural water alone, natural rainfall, and the moisture that's kind of left over in the soil. On the tall end of the scale, up above me, this is a western redbud. It will get maybe about 15 feet tall, 15 feet across, and it does lose its leaves, it's deciduous, but in the springtime, just as the leaves are emerging, it gets these big, beautiful magenta flowers. It looks a lot like a fruit tree, where they have the um, flowers emerging just as the leaves are emerging as well. Another fun native is monkey flower. This is one of the hybrids, and they come in all sorts of different colors. They come in pink and yellow and burgundy and white. This one is sort of a... I don't know, sort of a pale burgundy in a way. And the nice thing about these is they bloom just about all year. They're kind of sticky. One of the common names is sticky monkey flower. And so when you touch it, it looks a little stinky, but it just keeps blooming. It's a great bloomer even in the heat. 
The last native I'd like to show you is coral bells. This particular one isn't blooming right now, but it sends up these beautiful wands of very dark red flowers that are tiny little flowers. Beautiful foliage year round, almost looks like an old fashioned piggyback plant. And again, a very low water plant, likes anything from dry shade on up to a fair amount of sun. So thanks for going on this tour with me. Hopefully we've been able to provide you with some inspiration for your own garden. If you need any more tips or techniques, you're welcome to give me a call. Otherwise, I wish you luck with your WaterWise garden and happy gardening.